Well, good morning. I greet you in Jesus' name this morning. Today is a very special day because today is Mother's Day. And you know, I was trying to think back. I know I've had different messages about the roles of men and women and different things like that, but I don't know that I've ever actually had a Mother's Day message. So I really felt led to share one with you this morning. And I'm dedicating this message to all the mothers that are in our church and to those mothers who are going to be watching on the internet that maybe I don't even know. But I'm also dedicating this message to the young ladies who look forward to being mothers. The call of motherhood is a high calling. And it's one that has been pretty much minimized in our world today. I also want to dedicate this message to my mother. She's 95 years old now. She's not doing very well. And I wish I could go down and see her. But because of the COVID-19 situation, I can't do that. So I'm unable to visit her at this time. But I hope that she has a wonderful Mother's Day. And I also want to dedicate this message to my wife. She's been a wonderful helpmate to me and a great mother to our children. So to all of you this morning, happy Mother's Day. You know, like I said, in the world today, motherhood has been very minimized. And what I mean by that is I don't think that most people in America even think that being a mother is a calling. They don't think staying at home and taking care of the children is a number one priority. Many people in America today think that career is first, children is second. Many people in the world even belittle motherhood. You know, I remember hearing a story one time where somebody was talking to someone and they said, well, I'm not just going to be a mom, and saying it in kind of a way that it was derogatory. I even had a customer stop in and uh, she saw some of the pictures I had on the wall in my shop and she says to me, oh, well, how many children do you have and what are their ages and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, so I start going through and I say, well, you know, Laura's 18 and, and uh, all of a sudden her eyes kind of perked up and she says, oh, so, so is your daughter going to go to college? And I said, well, you know, probably not unless she really feels a calling to do something from God that needs a college education. And I kind of proceeded to explain to her how we felt that the Bible teaches young women are to marry and to be a helper to their husband, help raise the children, and so forth. And, you know, she kind of gives me this weird stare and uh, said something like, well, of course she can always be a wife and a mother, but what about her career? Her comments kind of struck me because it seems like that's the typical response that I hear from those in the world. Those who put a value on motherhood, they don't really understand. I'm sorry, those who don't put a value on motherhood, they don't really understand when you say something like that. But it is a wonderful calling. And I can tell you from scripture that you who have accepted the role of motherhood and have committed your lives to being a mother, have done nothing wrong. You've not even shortchanged yourself. In fact, you have done what is biblical. You have accepted this calling of being a stay-at-home mom and have done a good thing, and I want to honor you today. For an opening text, I'd like you to turn to Titus chapter 2. And we'll be looking at the first five verses in Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience. The older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to, their, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Now I'm not going to be 
saying very much to the men today because today is Mother's Day. And there's plenty of things that we as men should be doing and, act, and how we should act and what our roles are as well. You know, if we as men don't fulfill our biblical role, it is a lot harder for women to fulfill their biblical role. So, and the, and the reverse is true as well. If, if wives won't for, fulfill their biblical role, men have a harder time filling their role. So it, it, you need both, both of men and women, husband and wife, need to fulfill their biblical roles and do their part. Now, of course, it all starts with God. If, if both men and women are committed to God, there's a lot to work with. But if men and women aren't quite so committed to God and start wanting to do their own thing, things fall apart pretty quickly. But it's out of that love for God, out of that adoration to him, that we can fill our biblical roles. In uh, verse 3, in Titus 2, it talks about the qualities of older women. And then in verse 4, it says that the older women should teach the younger ones. So even when we get older and our children are raised, God still has an important role for us. You know, and that role shouldn't be minimized. You, you know, sometimes I kind of think that as men and women get a little bit older, they kind of think, well, I can't do everything like I used to do, or I can't... No, that, you know... <laughs> I know this is actually a story about my dad, but I can remember when I first bought my very first house and my dad was getting up in years and, and I wanted to lay out a wall and put studs up and everything and, and I asked him to come and help me. And he, well, I, I, I can't do anything anymore. And I said, Dad, I don't necessarily need your muscles. I need your mind. When I'm laying this out or if I'm doing something wrong, I want you to be able to tell me, no, I wouldn't do it that way or you need to do it this way. And the same is so true for you older women. You know, you've been through it. You have wisdom, you have knowledge, you have many of the answers. And, you know, when I think of times when Heidi might be homeschooling and the children are rambunctious and they're not wanting to learn and, you know, we can't find one of the books and the phone is ringing and, and you know, something else happens and, you know, you, you know what kind of day I'm talking about. Everything just falls apart. Well, I've seen Heidi take the time to sit down and read something that an older woman had wrote that had already been through this and it encouraged her. I've seen her reach out to older women to ask questions. How do you do this? How do you get through this? So, older women, you have such an important role to play in this whole thing of motherhood and with younger women. You know, just being able to say to a younger woman who had one of those days, you'll get through this. You'll make it. Just keep putting one foot in front of the other, and you'll get through this. Don't give up. Teaching young women to be good mothers is an important function and it has everlasting blessings. Then Titus 2 goes on to say what it is that women with children, younger children usually, should do. And it is in this description that in my mind constitutes what it means to be a mother. First, it talks about loving their husband and their children. Now what does that look like? Well, I could stand up here for hours, I guess, to explain all that. But when it says love, I mean, you know, even the word love has been so misconstrued. Well, you don't necessarily need to turn there, but when I think of the definition of love, I think of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and in verses 4 through 7, it says this. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. That's love. 
Jesus said, no greater love is any man than this, but that he laid down his life for his friend. What is that? That's sacrifice. When I think of motherhood, I think of sacrifice. Love means to sacrifice. Think of Jesus. He sacrificed his eternal glory in heaven to come down to this earth and be as a man. And then he sacrificed his life here on in this earth for us. And as we look at mothers, we see sacrifice. You know, my mom was always there for me. I really don't remember a time when she wasn't. When I was sick, she was there to comfort me. When I was outside playing or working or something and I got a cut, I'd come in bleeding and screaming and she'd bandage my wounds. When I was a little boy, I, I don't know why, but I always seemed to end up with a stomach ache in the middle of the night. And when I ended up with that stomach ache, I'd go running into her bedroom and say, Mom, Mom, my stomach hurts. And she would make a little bed for me on the couch, take my temperature, maybe give, you some, give me some medicine. And I do always remember her praying for me. She sacrificed sleep and her own desires for her husband and her children. Then when I was a teenager, she'd listen to me. And I would talk to her through some of the struggles that I was having. You know, I know we have a lot of young adults in our congregation. And it's a, it's the right word. There, there are some struggles that happen when we transition from childhood to adulthood. And when I needed a listening ear while I was going through those struggles, Mom was there. Mothers sacrifice time and energy for their family. Thank you, moms. I watched as my mother made meals day after day for us. We would come in from the barn hungry, and she almost always had something cooking on the stove. I watched as my mother would do laundry and clean the house and do many of the daily tasks that needed to be done, all because she knew her calling and she wanted to fulfill it. And it was because of her that when I was looking for a wife, I wanted to find a wife who would be willing to do the same. And as I reflect on my wife and how she is the wife and mother of our children, I see many similarities. You know, there's so many little things that we take for granted sometimes, I think, as husbands and children especially. I walked into my closet the other night. There were all my clothes folded, put neatly away. It is such a blessing to have a clean house and good food and folded laundry. I am forever grateful to my mother and to my wife for doing these things that show love. I thank God for a wife who is willing to serve in the home. Day after day, I see her giving of herself and for me, for, for me and for our children. And when one of the little ones gets sick, they love to climb up on her lap and be comforted. Being a mother, though, is much more than cooking and cleaning and doing laundry. Probably the easiest way that I can describe it is it's making a house into a home. You know, we as men, we can get out the tools and we can build it. And when we're done, we say, look at that house. We as men can provide a lot of things and that is our job. But it takes the woman's touch to transform the house into a home. We can provide the shelter, but it's the mother who organizes the space 
and does the little things like hanging pictures on the wall, putting a knickknack on the shelf. And it's those types of things that really build memories. You know, I can still remember when I got done painting the wall in our house that we're living in, and it was like, it was all done. It was completely bare, and it was, I, I just thought it was beautiful. And then when my wife comes with the hammer and the nail to hang something, I was kind of like, ah, no. <laughs> but I realized that it's those things that are special and that make the memories. You know, when I was a little boy, we had some very interesting I guess I want to say like horse and horseshoe type lamps that were hanging above our couch. And I still remember those things. They're still in my mind. I remember the painting that was hanging above our love seat. I can still see that in my mind's eye. My mom never claimed to be good at decorating. But even the little bit of decorating that she did, it was those little things that I remember. So I honor you, Mom, for how you sacrificed your life for your family. And I honor you, Heidi, as you have sacrificed your life for your family. And I honor all you mothers this morning for sacrificing your life for your husbands and your children. And what you mothers have taught and are teaching your children will have a great influence on the next generation. Never underestimate the role you are playing. It's a very important role. Another thing that I must say about mothers, which maybe falls more under the category of being a wife, is that moms, you have more influence on your husbands than any other person in the world. Titus 2 there says to love your husbands. And in Ephesians it says to respect your husbands. Your love and your respect gives your husband the power and the ability to do things that he can't do on his own. You know, most men can handle ridicule from the world. But they can't handle ridicule from their wife. I would much rather be disrespected by the whole world than to be disrespected by my wife. And wives, make sure that you use this power wisely because it really is true that behind every great man is a great woman. Men simply can't do all these things on their own unless they're supported by a loving, respectful wife. And for you men out there, make sure that you give your love and affection to your wife because she needs that the same way that you need respect. Then Titus goes on to say that women should be discreet, chaste, and homemakers. Now these three things go against everything the world says that women should be. The world says women should take control and uh, I don't know if I want to say that they say that they should wear immodest clothing, but that's what they do. Um, that women should go out and get a job, get a career, put your children in daycare. Oh, why even have children? But that's not the call that God gives mothers. That's not the call that God has given to women. To be discreet means to be subtle and unobtrusive. It means to be more behind the scenes. That doesn't mean without any influence. It just means having influence in a different way. Chaste means to be pure, clean, simple, and without unnecessary ornamentation. Now if you go into anywhere in Bemidji pretty much on a hot summer day, I don't think you're going to find very many women who are chaste or discreet anymore. There are some, and I am glad for that, but most are not. The world does not encourage being chaste or discreet. But we who are called to be Christians 
and to follow the Bible. We need to be the role models for our children that the Bible calls us to be. We are to follow what God says, not what the world says. And we as men need to do what all we can do to encourage our wives and our daughters to model themselves after what the Bible says, not what the world says. God's outline for the home and family have very specific roles for men and women, and we've talked about that here before. And if we want to have godly children, if we want to have a godly church, if we want to have a godly society, then we must live in accordance with godly principles. Our American society has been in decline for many years now. And the main reason that I think it is, I mean, first of all, is because we've stepped away from godly principles. But it's been carried out because men and women have both left their God-given roles. Men, when you don't appreciate your wives and provide for them, love them as they should be loved, well, then they start stepping out of their God-given roles in various different ways. Women, when you don't respect your husbands and when you stop being a home manager, your husband will also kind of step out from his God-given role. Many different ways that that happens. It's no secret that if you look at history, when the family unit is strong and functioning, the society is strong and functioning. When the family unit is weak, society is weak. You know, I've said this probably too many times, but it, it just struck such a nerve to me when I first heard it. What we grow up with is what we consider to be normal. And when you think about that, if we grew up in a biblical, functional home, we're going to have maybe better ideas or have some background to, to be able to raise our children in that way. And that's good. I'm going to say, though, that if that would be you, be careful not to relax and just kind of let things slide because it can easily uh, go backwards and we can lose our children and our church in one generation. But on the flip side of that, if we grew up in a dysfunctional home and was unbiblical, we're gonna, we are going to have a tendency to parent in that same way. But I want to give you hope if that is you. Because if God can change a sinner to a saint, and that's what the Bible says, God changes us as sinners into saints. He can take a dysfunctional child and turn them into a functional biblical parent. He can do it. But no matter what kind of home you grow up in, the most important thing is to stay on your knees. Because Satan is out there to try to trip and get every one of our children. But God is more powerful than Satan. So that's nothing to worry about. But we can't just let our guard down. So it is of utmost importance if we want strong churches and strong societies, we need to have strong families. Now it's debatable how the family unit was lost in our society and you know, was it, was it men stepping out from their roles? Was it women stepping out from their roles? I mean, we know they walked away from God. I mean, we can debate the causes of that all day long. But there is no denying that our American society as a whole has declined morally over the years. We as a society have become more dysfunctional. We've become so dysfunctional in this society that we have redefined marriage. We have redefined the family. We have redefined what it is to be masculine, to be feminine. And we have even confused what it means to be biologically a man or a woman. I have never seen so much division in this country on even the most basic of things. But it doesn't surprise me. 
Because our society has forgotten about God and has forgotten about his principles. Biblical truth has been lost. But praise God, we who call on his name and live for him can maintain what it means to be godly. And we can have a godly home. Titus 2 also says that women are to be homemakers. Now I'm going to change it a little bit to home managers. I don't know why, but as I was thinking about this and putting this message together, it's like, well, they're the same thing, and I think they have this whole, the same intent. Um, because, well, f- well, first of all, being a home manager or a homemaker is a vital and wonderful role. Children who grow up in an orderly home that's managed well have a huge head start when they get out on their own. Now, I don't necessarily think that I need to define what all that means because what we've been talking about so far, so far kind of defines what it means to be a homemaker or a home manager. But I use the word manager because when you think about uh, a man who, has, who owns a business, he hires a manager, and he manages the finances and takes care of issues and does things that makes the business run. Well, for... Mothers, being a home manager, it's a higher calling than a business because you're dealing with souls. But there's so much of the daily tasks that are so similar that you take what income your husband provides or or whatever money you have or whatever um, resources you have and you manage them. And you deal with taking care of children and things like that. So being a home manager is a huge vital role. Then Titus 2 goes on to say that women need to be good and obedient to their husbands. I think all of us know what it means to be good. And I realize that uh, it's really politically incorrect to say that women need to be obedient to their husbands. But all I can really say is, if you have any problems with this, don't blame me. I didn't say it. God did. He is the one who inspired the Apostle Paul to say this. I didn't say it. I'm just repeating what he said. But in that word, being obedient to your husbands, that doesn't mean that we hold our wives down per se. All that really means is that at the end of the day, God has given men the charge to make the final decision. And so when men have to take, make a final decision... It is expected that the wives would be in support of that. But that doesn't mean that while you're making the decision, you don't consult your wife. I would say anyone who is making any kind of an important decision as a man, if you don't consult your wife in that decision, that's, can I say foolish? I mean, that would just, you wouldn't do that. You always consult your wife and maybe your adult children, if whatever the case may be before you make a decision. But in the end, it is still the man, the head of the home, that has to make the decision. You know, and even in that, I've heard different people kind of say, well, that's not fair, and this and that. You know, it's maybe not fair the way the world calls fair. But I can also say that on Judgment Day, God will hold us as men accountable for those decisions. And we are going to have a higher accountability than our wives will. I don't know if that's fair either. But this is the way God has set it up. And we need to be obedient to that. Now I could go on and talk about how we're to honor and love our mothers. And, and I've been saying some of these things and we should cherish them and we should. We should do all these things. But I'm sure some of you are probably thinking, well, I'm not a perfect mom. Or, my mom isn't perfect. What do I do about that? Well, you're right. Moms aren't perfect. No one is perfect. But I think there is good and there is love in every mother. If nothing else, 
the most basic of things you could say is that my mother loved me enough that she gave birth to me. You know, childbirth is not easy. I've been with my wife through the birth of every one of our children, and I, I so many times wish I could take her place. Mom loved you enough to give birth to you. Now to finish off the message here, I maybe want to reflect a little bit and have a little more personal touch to what I've been sharing so far. I'd like to talk about my mom and my wife as a mother. My mother is from one of 13 children. She grew up on a farm, and by being born and raised on a farm, that gave her a good foundation for married life because she ended up marrying a farmer. But she grew up poor by today's standards, but she said she had a happy childhood. I can remember hearing a story. She was born in 1925, and she told me a story one time about when she was a little girl, they were playing with a ball, and, you know, they had one ball. One ball for the whole family. And, you know, but they didn't know any better. They didn't know that, well, wouldn't it be nice to have five balls or whatever, you know, that's all they had. It was during the time of the Depression, and everybody was in the same boat. They had one ball, but they were happy. She didn't have much growing up. She later married my father and lived on a dairy farm. Now, as a small dairy farmer, my dad was never rich, but we always had enough. But being on the farm meant that there was always work that needed to be done. And that also meant that there was always boys who were hungry. So making meals and doing laundry was a big part of mom's life. My family consisted of eight boys and two girls, and in our household, the boys pretty much did the outside work and the girls did the inside work. That wasn't true all the time. There was times when my sisters would go out and help and there were times when the boys would help inside too. So I mean, but for the most part, from my perspective, that's kind of how it was. And most people probably can't even relate to this anymore, but I don't know, uh, I don't know of anybody right now that has to wash laundry for 12 people with a ringer washer. So washing laundry on a dairy farm, if you can imagine that, with that many boys, meant laundry was going pretty much every day until the older ones started moving out. Mom really didn't like being outside and doing much of the farm work, but she worked very hard inside in the house. I can remember my dad telling a story that when they were first married, he got the tractor stuck. And... They didn't have any children that could go out and drive another tractor to pull it out. So he asked my mom if he could help, if she could help him to go out and pull out this tractor. And he said, all you got to do is get the chain tight and let out the clutch and then go. And, and so my dad coached her exactly how to do it, and, and she did it. So she did do that kind of stuff once in a while. But uh, for the most part, she stayed at home in the house. But she was a good home manager. She never worked outside the home after she was married. And she was able to take the income that my father brought in and make it stretch to raise all of us children. But mom didn't do everything perfect either. But we always knew that she loved us. I can still remember one time when she was making a meal and she accidentally opened the pressure cooker up a little too quickly and we were scraping potatoes off the ceiling. Yeah, stuff like that happened in our home too. It happens in every home. And I also want to give honor to my wife. She's been a wonderful wife and mother, and I can't imagine life without Heidi. She's also not worked outside the home since Laura was born, 
But that doesn't mean she doesn't work. She's one of the hardest workers I know. Her day starts at 6 a.m. and doesn't end till late at night. And it seems like lately her day always ends with sorting clean laundry. She has trained our daughters well. And hopefully they will be able to take those skills that they have learned when they get their families. She has given up much for the sake of her family. And I really appreciate all that she does. I want to honor all of you this morning that are watching, all of you mothers. I wish I could see your faces. <laughs> Motherhood is a high calling. Don't waste it. Don't think it's secondary. You have one of the most important roles in all of the world. I'd like to end this message by reading a couple of poems. This first poem was written by Erla Burdick, and it's a little bit more realistic. It starts out like this. Every ch child wishes for that just perfect mom, the kind who does everything right and never anything wrong. She must say the right things and be perfectly dressed, keep a clean house and be happy and never ever depressed. It's her job to make sure her family feels blessed and each member made happy with egos caressed. This all sounds very nice. What a lovely world it would be if every mother was perfect, meeting every child's need. But moms are just human and make mistakes on the way. Lives filled with trials like ours to deal with every day. How can we ask them to be more than they are able when, when not a single one can wear that perfect mom label? Try to look at your mom from a new point of view. And as you grow older and wiser, you'll see her anew. Each mother is different with good points and bad. Praise the fine things. Talk about what makes you unhappy or sad. If you pray for your mom, Ask God to make her heart glad for good memories she's given and the good times that you've had. Every mother is special, precious, and select. For this very reason, give her honor and respect. Love her like you did when you were so tender and small because she clearly hasn't stopped loving you through it all. So God bless our dear moms the ones we came through. And we should forever be saying, Mom, thank you. This last one is just kind of a sweet, simple little poem. I just want to let you know you mean the world to me. Only a heart as dear as yours would give so unselfishly. The many things you've done, all the times that you were there, helps me know deep down inside how much you really care. Even though I might not say I appreciate all you do, richly blessed is how I feel having a mother just like you. So to bring this message to a close this morning, give your mom a hug if you can. Husbands, give your wife a hug. Make this day special for her. I am just so blessed to be part of a group that puts an emphasis on biblical motherhood. And I am so blessed to be able to know each and every one of you. Don't let the world say that motherhood is second rate. Not at all. It's the most important, important gift you can give your children. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you. I thank you for giving us mothers. I just thank you for a day when we can maybe reflect and make things special for our 
mothers and our wives. And Lord, I just pray that as we go through this time, go through this day and week, and that we would think about all the things that our mothers gave up so that they could give their lives basically for us. Help us, Lord, to not take our mothers for granted. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and have a happy Mother's Day.